Hey, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about authentication today. This is a lot of the stuff that I deal with in my day-to-day -day work. Um, but the way that I wanted to approach this is from some of the, uh, the research papers that I've been reading about this. And uh, In 2014, there was a research paper from Microsoft uh, from a guy named James Mickens that he called This World of Ours. Has anybody read this? It's a very entertaining, like, short paper that I, I suggest that you go check out. Uh, but like a lot of security research is incredibly morbid. Uh, so in it, he boils down our threat model to two potential adversaries. So we have Mossad, the Israeli intelligence group, and not Mossad. So his idea is that if you're dealing with not Mossad, you're probably OK to go about your life using strong passwords as your defense mechanism. But if you're dealing with Mossad, well, you're going to have to go fake your own death and live in this submarine because there's not a lot that you can do. So I think this is an oversimplification of the reality that we live in. But uh, as security professionals, I think a lot of what we have to struggle with is how we find the balance and how much we want to complicate this type of simplification. So we have to figure out where on this spectrum we want to be between simpler solutions like passwords and more complex solutions like this. This is something that he mentions in the paper, and I hope it's still fictional. Uh, but uh, Enway Bojangle spaces, you know, maybe that exists. If somebody invented that, come talk to me about it. I'd love to hear what problem you think you're trying to solve. Uh, but a more interesting paper, in my opinion, came from another Microsoft researcher in 2009. And this is uh, Hurley and the Rational Rejection of Security Advice by Users. And he argues that when non-experts reject security advice, they're often doing it for incredibly reasonable uh, and rational reasons. So how do we as security professionals help users avoid harm? And I think this is the question that I want to try to answer today. I wrap this into what I'm calling threat modeling authentication. Uh, we're going to talk about why this is hard, why identity management is a, a challenge that we have, and why authentication is so difficult, how you can evaluate the risk for your users, and some of the actions that you might want to take to keep your users safe. So once again, my name is Kelly. Um, I work at Twilio. Uh, Twilio is a communications company, so we have APIs for doing things like sending and receiving text messages, um, voice calls, and authentication. Uh, I work specifically on our account security products. So uh, if there's any Authy users here, Twilio acquired them about five years ago. And so I work on the APIs for doing things like phone verification and multi-factor authentication. Um, I also spend a lot of time uh, in my job doing security education, especially for developers. My background is all in software engineering. And so so a lot of the, the audiences that I speak to and uh, work with are developers that I'm trying to get to care about security. Uh, so this talk is going to incorporate a lot of the things that I have learned from talking to developers about authentication um, in my time at Twilio. So let's talk about threat modeling, especially for the applications that we're working with. Uh, we want to talk about what we're building, the risks uh, to the things that we're going to be building, how we can evaluate those risks and mitigate them, and then finally, some way to measure whether or not we did a good job. Uh, a lot of this talk is going to focus on uh, consumer or public-facing accounts, mostly because that's what I know and deal with. Uh, if there's an area of authentication that's missing, please come talk to me after this. This is you know, a 25-minute talk, so we're not going to be able to cover everything. Uh, so we're also not going to be talking about things like session hacking, um, JSON web tokens, cookie stealing, that kind of stuff. So just so you know, we're going to be talking a lot about the process of authentication with things like sign up and login. So the problem with threat models is that it's very specific to whatever your business is. So uh, you're going to have to be thinking about the businesses and the things that you're going to be securing under this. So I want to talk about the commonalities of the, the solutions that we're going to be building. Uh, and let's walk through a few assumptions with that. So the first assumption that I want to make is that your users have something of value that is connected to a personal account. Uh, and this is going to be the main assumption for our authenticated system. Uh, the second assumption is that the user can only access that value once they are authenticated. So we want to have some kind of t way to tie them to their account um, in a way that they can access that value. And finally, uh, the third assumption is that if, a success for, if the, an impersonator is successful, they could also access that user's value. Um, and a lot of what we're going to be talking about is how to make this step complicated and tedious enough for the hacker so it's not worth their time. So how common is this? This is a huge problem. It dropped off in 2015 when credit card chips were introduced. Um, but account takeovers cost uh, 
are back up to costing us about $5.1 billion every year. Uh, this may be different depending on the business that you're in. A lot of the fraud that we see is related to um, banking, financial institutions, and other type of businesses. But uh, the value that uh, people might get from hacking your accounts is not always related to money. But a lot of this is happening because online identity is fallible. Uh, and we like to believe that we have these perfect systems for uh, convincing computers that we are who we say we are. But that's all baked into trust uh, systems of trust. Um, somebody mentioned in the, in the keynote, I hadn't heard that term before, but trust anchors. I really like that idea of having a trust anchor for something that we're dealing with. And identity is incredibly baked into these trust anchors of, of different systems that we have decided that we want to believe uh, that they know what they're talking about. And how we design those systems and establish that trust is part of this exercise that we want to walk through today. So I want to break down the different types of identities that we have and kind of go through this waterfall of the different trust anchors that we are, we're creating and the different ways that we're uh, basically knowing the identities of the people that we're dealing with. And so the first category of this is really going to be physical identities. And these are things like biometrics, and these are things that we can't change about ourselves. Um, the second is government identities. Uh, so these are things that are uh, validated or issued by the state, so passports, social security numbers in the US, um, things like that. And finally, what I'm calling contextual identities. And so this is something that is going to be established uh, with, you know, individual accounts. This is the types of identities that were established a lot of times since the internet uh, became a thing. Uh, these are not, uh, these are easier to change about yourself. Um, they're not necessarily tied to something like biometrics uh, specifically. So if you're verifying identity with any kind of trusted contact, especially in the real world, physical identity is the way that you want to do that. There's a huge amount of power in somebody saying, I recognize that person. And this is a lot of the trust anchors that we have in our systems, and this is how we built identities through most of the history until we started dealing in such scope with the people that we don't know over the internet. And so this is, you know, the, the systems that we have in place now are largely because we don't trust the other people that we're dealing with and we've never met them in person. Uh, government identities uh, are one of the ways that we deal with untrusted contacts, and in that sense, we're passing the trust on to another body that we do trust. This, of course, falls apart if we don't trust our government, uh, but right now, I think one of the things that we're able to do is, you know, you check into a hotel, you give them your ID and your credit card, and they're saying, cool, I trust the government and this bank that this person is who they say they are, that they're checking into this, uh, into this hotel room. And so in this type of situation, we're essentially saying, I trust that the government knows this person. And finally, we end up with these contextual identities uh, that may not guarantee much of anything. Uh, so a lot of online accounts fall back to identity, other identities for validation. Um, you know, if you are opening up something like a bank account or something that needs to be uh, overly secure like that, uh, you're going to have to give up your social security number at some point. You might have to send a copy of your driver's license. And so you're getting back to those government identities that people need to start to uh, validate. So trust is a waterfall. And at the end of the day, we're just going back on someone's word. And this is hard because we're all just trying to prove to some system that we are who we say we are. And we're doing this with a lot of different methods, clicking stop signs. There's a really good bit from John Mulaney about this. Definitely go check that out. Um, and we also want to prove that we're not a robot. We want to prove that we're a re real human. And there's a variety of ways that we're doing this, but the systems are imperfect. And one of the most challenging things about this is that we may never know if we got it right. You're not often going to meet the people that you're authenticating in your online systems through your website. You may never know if somebody actually is who they say they are. And we're just going to have to build our systems in a way that that part doesn't really matter. So of course, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with this. Um, this is another quote from the uh, paper on rational advice for uh, security users. And I, I like what he does with this analysis because he takes a very calculation-driven approach uh, to the usefulness of security advice. Uh, and this is, I think, interesting because a lot of what we're asking of, of the users when we're asking them to take security advice is for their time. But it's also a lot of things that they use if they get compromised. It's not necessarily money. Like, that might be part of it. But you know, it's relatively easy to fight a bank charge. But then you're going to uh, have to spend all this time revalidating that you are who you say you are, a lot of time on the phone with somebody like to re uh, gain control of your account. And he goes on to say that, like, 
the worst case scenario is generally what we as security researchers uh, often think about. Uh, there's a lot of security advice out there that talks about the worst case. And the reason for that is that's more exciting. The average case is not as exciting to deal with. Uh, but we need to estimate the victimization rate for a lot of these things, because if we don't, the worst case analysis is going to lull us into this false sense that we're doing a lot more good with our security mitigations than we actually are. So some of the things that can go wrong with um, authentication processes, uh, and this is definitely not an exhaustive list by any means, but the two things I want to talk about are compromised factors. Um, so these are if your credentials can get hacked, guessed, fished, brute forced. Um, a lot of the risk that we come up with in these situations happens to do with somehow your, your factors getting compromised. Um, I included links there at the bottom for the threat model uh, research for the OAuth 2 protocol and the OpenID Connect protocol. And I think those are good things to go reference if you want to learn more about this, because for specific SSO implementations, those gave a really good uh, different approaches to how they thought about the, the risks of their systems. There's also some known weak points in these authentication systems, and I want to talk about two of them because these are things that a lot of companies, if you have any kind of system, any kind of contact center or account recovery process, you're going to have to deal with at some point. So first, request uh, via a contact center. If anybody's ever been to a social engineering CTF, those things are fascinating. And it's really interesting to see the people, uh, how successful people are at vishing uh, people on the other end of the line. And a lot of that is because we're all human. Humans are fallible. We're trustworthy people that we want to help out at the end of the day. Um, but most contact centers don't have the same security rigor that you might have in your online authentication processes. It's not as easy to put like a form on your web on through a contact center as it is to put in a on a phone or on a computer. Uh, but it's also interesting because a lot of times there's really high risk activities that are happening through a contact center. So you might have a situation where you can only cancel your account, create a new account, um, change certain personally identifiable information. So there's some companies that only allow you to do that through the contact center, and so you're creating a lot of risk in these situations. Other things that can go wrong with account recovery, uh, a lot of this has to do with how strict do you want to make the process, because you're essentially restarting this entire process and saying, OK, we're going to reestablish your identity and like hope that your identity that you're reestablishing is the same as the one we were using before. Uh, so account recovery gets into all of these edge cases, uh, and it is one of those more ex obvious examples of the trade-offs between how rigorous you want to make the process uh, for the user and the level of security that you want to uh, achieve. How many hoops do you want to make your users jump through? So finally, I think we can think about what goes wrong in terms of the value of what's being protected. And one of the things that I, I think is important is, yes, like this is going to depend on the business that you're in, but this is also going to depend on the individual user accounts. And so there's a lot more value in ha hacking higher value targets than there is to the lower value targets, as you can see in this very official risk assessment. So I, I mentioned that the goal of this is not to make, uh, is to make it the impersonator's time not worth it for them to try to hack this. Um, and so naturally, there's more incentive for higher tar uh, value accounts. And this applies not just to the business you're in. Like I said, it also applies to the types of customers. And value, in this case, doesn't just have to be money. So you can be hacking people's accounts for uh, information, power, and control as well. So you think about this as a lot more value in hacking Barack Obama's Twitter account uh, than there is to hack my Twitter account, because he has a lot more power associated with that uh, platform. And this is where our strategies for authentication come in. How are we going to mitigate these risks that we see? First, we have to prioritize this. And one of the things that I think we need to remember is that uh, users are inundated with security advice all of the time. And the more advice that we give them and the more conflicting advice that we give them, uh, they're just going to start ignoring that advice. And so we have to prioritize the advice that we're giving them and make it reasonable for them to, uh, to follow the advice that we have. So better yet, uh, we're going to design our systems in a way so that users don't have to think about this. 
Uh, one option that you have is SSO. Uh, this is an example of passing the trust. You're going to be saying that instead I trust Google, I trust Facebook to handle this authentication process. Uh, also, like in the keynote this morning, I think, you know, if you're moving all of your hardware to the cloud, you're passing that trust on to saying that I trust Amazon and AWS to be able to secure my hardware better than I'm going to do it myself. It's also, there's a lot of uh, usability uh, reasons that you might do this. It's easier for people to log on. But like, it's, it's convenient, but you're also opening yourself up to a new category of vulnerabilities. Uh, specifically, a lot of dating apps had to reevaluate this uh, when there was so much backlash against Facebook earlier this year. Uh, dating apps had to move to things like phone verification and first party login systems because they were all on the system of only using Facebook to log in, and all of a sudden people didn't want to do that anymore. So like everything, your mileage may vary with something like this. Um, and so the other method that you have is these different uh, factors for authentication. And generally we break these into something that you know, like a password, something that you have, like a phone, and something that you are, like biometric data, your fingerprint. Uh, so the example of this that we usually give is something like a debit card and a PIN number. That's something that you have and something that you know. Um, in this case, you know, you're kind of ignoring all security advice and going back to zero factors if you're both giving out the something that you know. <laughs> uh, so the biggest way that we've done something with passwords is, uh, or some, with something we know is passwords. And so for online authentication systems, a lot of uh, a lot of the ways that we authenticate things are with passwords. So this is from a. a app from Samantha B. They, uh, they basically, it's a, it's a get out the vote app, but they give the very rational security advice to just don't use the same password that you're using for your banking app. And I actually love this because it's telling people something very straightforward. You know, it's obviously snarky about the security aspect of it, but you know, users can resonate with this. And it, it's also reaching an audience that it makes sense for. Uh, but passwords are fallible, and it's one of the worst ways that we can ask users to be secure because it's one of the only ways that we're making users think. And thinking is exhausting. <laughs> we don't want to have to make users think. Um, but until we all become cyborgs and implant chips in ourselves and the robots take over, we're probably going to have to keep supporting passwords. Um, dealing with a lot of people in authentication, I hear a lot of people being like, we're going to get rid of passwords forever. And I think there's ways that we might be able to do that, but it's definitely not going to be in my lifetime. We're definitely going to see passwords stick around for a while, and so it is something that we're going to have to keep supporting. One way to make this easier for your customers is, is to set sensible uh, password requirements, minimum length of like eight characters. It's better than six, but not too many. Um, and let them set their passwords, but also alert them if the password that they're trying to set has been known to be compromised. And one really great way to do this is through the Owned Passwords API. How many people have heard of this? So about half of you. So Troy Hunt, who is a security researcher, also at Microsoft, all the good people are at Microsoft. Um, so they, he has this website that's called haveibeenowned.com. It's great. You can go type in your email and say if your email address has come up in any data breaches. He also has an API for typing in your password to see if your password has come up in any data breaches. Um, the way that he stores that data is actually really interesting. And in the more recent versions of the API, he has a way that you can uh, submit your password and see if your password has been compromised actually giving him your password. And so you can do a basic SHA-1 hash on your password, truncate that to the first five characters, send the first five characters to him, and he'll return a list of all of the suffixes that match that prefix. And so then you get a shortened list of maybe like 30 to 100 things, and you can search through that list to see if your suffix is there. So it's a really creative way to check if your password has been uh, owned without actually giving him your password, because as much as we'd like to think that you know he's not doing anything nefarious with that, that is definitely a way that people might be able to then log all of the credentials that you're worried about giving up. Uh, and so one of the things that's interesting about this is that this approach is also going to cover a lot of uh, guessable or brute forceable passwords, because the uh, own passwords list has a lot of the most common passwords in it. Um, you could also uh, expand this to do things like not include common dictionary words. I don't know how many of those are included in the, his list, but you could build out a system like this that is pretty quick to implement, or pretty quick to query, um, that allows you to uh, let your users use passwords that aren't as easy to guess. Um, and so GitHub is a service that implemented this, and so now when you set your password on GitHub, they do check it against this uh, known uh, breached passwords list, and they won't let you set it if it's been something that has been seen in a previous data breach. 
And if passwords aren't enough, then you can start to add other layers. And there are a lot of ways that you can add additional factors for something like multi-factor authentication. But once you do this, it's not enough to just make it an option for your users. You actually have to get your users to turn it on. And so you can make it mandatory, but if you don't want to do that, here are some of the strategies that we've seen that make it a bit easier for people to enable multi-factor authentication. So if you put it in profile settings, uh, you're going to see about 2% of users actually find that setting and turn it on. If you make it part of the onboarding process, and so maybe this is part of the login flow, and you prompt them if they don't have MFA turned on to say, hey, do you want to turn on two-factor authentication? Then you see about 40% of users turn it on. And of course, if your company has an ICO, then you're getting 100% adoption. <laughs> Um, but that's another example of like a situation where you're probably going to have more security conscious users anyway, and you're making the value of them doing that where, worth their time. Um, one thing that I do want to mention is that SMS 2FA gets a lot of crap, but it's still a lot better than having no 2FA at all. Uh, so this is another great example of the average case versus the worst case, and uh, talking about the different form factors of multi-factor authentication. Uh, so we've heard these articles about how SMS is less secure, uh, but talking about the dangers of SIM swapping and the SS7 vulnerabilities, to the average user, they are not going to really understand what any of that means, and that's just going to be another part of that you know, security advice fatigue that people are facing. Um, so it probably doesn't matter to a lot of people. So I wanted to talk about Reddit uh, in this context for a minute. And so Reddit had a security incident in August, and they published this really nice uh, uh, report on what happened. And basically what happened is that their employees' accounts got compromised uh, via an SMS uh, 2FA breach. And so the solution that they had for this was to require employees to have token-based authentication, so just a more secure form of authentication. And I think this is a great solution for them because one thing with uh, employee accounts is that you can enforce that type of authentication. It's easier to require a token-based 2FA for employees because you have an IT department that can physically hand them their YubiKey. You are paying them, and so they kind of have to do what you want them to do. It's a different model of a, a relationship than you have with some of your customers. Um, and so that, that makes it easier to require this stronger form of authentication. Uh, moderators on Reddit, uh, you might be thinking about how you could secure them. They're somebody that spends a lot more time on the service. And so they might see the value of turning something like this on. Again, this is something that's going to be a little bit more worth their time. And finally, for everyone else, you might just make it an option. For lurkers on the site or people that just casually comment, you might not care if they actually enable 2FA. And you can take this model and apply it to other industries. And so if you work in banking, you can start to think about how you might break this up with your customers by the level of money that they have in their account. Uh, similarly, you could do this for something like Twitter with verified accounts making token-based 2FA required uh, and then break it down by follower accounts. If you have over a certain number of followers, then make any kind of 2FA required. And for everyone else, make it optional. Let's talk about some of those known weak points and how we can address them. Uh, first, for requests via a contact center. So Patrick McKenzie works at Stripe, and last week he had this great tweet about how Stripe is using um, a, a, a new method of authentication in contact centers. And so one of the problems with contact centers is that we're often asking for identifiers instead of authenticators in that process. And so you're always going to be asked, uh, or not always, but a surprising uh, number of times you're going to be asked for your social security number over the phone, and that makes nobody happy. You don't want to have to give that. And so the solution that Stripe came up with, which I think is really clever, um, is if you're on an authenticated web session, you can basically pop up a, a token on that session and say, hey, if you want to try to call our customer support hotline, here's the token that we're, ha you're, you're, we're going to be using. The Stripe agent will give you the first four numbers, you'll give them the second four numbers, and now you both have this understanding that uh, you are who you say you are. And that's a really uh, great way to do it. It does require that the support agent and the customer both have authenticated sessions. So again, it's like the trust waterfall that you're hoping that somebody has that type of, uh, that type of authenticated system um, available to them. And you do have to do some coordination there. And when it comes to uh, account recovery, the same idea applies. Uh, so Security questions are often a way that we do this uh, for account recovery. Um, if you, you know, don't have access to the email or maybe your phone number anymore, then you fall back to these ideas of these, these security questions. But you don't want to make these things that are identifiable. You don't want to make these things that are available be, via open source intelligence. Uh, so 
it's really easy for people to Google these things without you. Um, so your Instagram account is giving away a lot more information than you realize, especially if it's public. Um, so some of the better security questions that we have get into these very specifics that aren't questions that are as easy to look up about a person. So these can be things like, what was the, the name of the teacher who gave you your first failing grade? So if you do have a situation where you need to use security questions, and I know we all have different ideas about the usefulness of security questions, but in large organizations, these are often still a requirement, but we want to be able to make the security questions that aren't something that we can easily Google about a person. And finally, we want to know if we did a good job. This will be easier if you had these metrics at the beginning, so make sure that you're setting your goals for yourself before you take on a project like this. Um, and examples of things that you might care about, uh, uh, overall money loss due to account takeovers, the number of compromised accounts that you're seeing, uh, support costs relative to the uh, to account takeover losses. You might not care about the total number of support tickets that are coming in if you're measuring the absolute value there because it might actually make more sense for you to have a higher number of support tickets if that's lowering your overall uh, accounts, uh, account takeover uh, losses. And finally, customer satisfaction. I think you want to have a way of measuring this that also takes into account how annoyed customers are with this process. So it's really easy to get depressed about this stuff. Um, <laughs> I think as security people, a lot of times we're dealing with this every day. Uh, this is literally our livelihood. So the time investment for us in thinking about this worst case scenario makes a lot more sense because one, working in security, we are inherently slightly higher targets, but we also have this paranoia and sometimes doing all of these things helps calm us, helps calm our anxieties, but that's one of the things that it, it is a little bit more rational for us to deal with this and have all these security measures than it is for the average person. So for somebody that's not always thinking about this stuff every day, we don't want necessarily want to take all of our paranoias and project it onto our friends and family. So this is a story that has always stuck with me. Uh, Kevin Roos is a tech reporter who asked two different hacking groups to uh, attack him. And they were incredibly successful. And so he had somebody that was able to install malware on his system, um, spyware on his system, and then he had somebody that was able to really effectively attack him via social engineering. Um, but the conclusion of this story, which I appreciated, wasn't that we're all screwed. It was that, you know, we have this idea of security through obscurity. Even a tech journalist like Kevin Roos, the experts that he got to attack him aren't going to go through those measures for most people. Uh, a lot of us are going to be in this situation where we're not going to necessarily have these types of sophisticated attacks employed against us. If we always believed that Mossad was after us, then we'd have to go back and live in that submarine, and nobody would be happy, and we'd all just, you know, be very miserable. So finally, the thing that I want to point out is just don't blame users. Try to avoid victim blaming and instead think about some of the tools that we discussed and the others that apply to your specific industries to make it easier for your customers to have good security hygiene. I hope I've given you some inspiration for how to think about your authentication systems. Uh, come find me after this if you have any questions. Uh, my slides are available at that link. Once again, my name is Kelly Robinson, and thank you for listening.